Life insurance is only for older, rich people. Life insurance isn't for younger people who have no marriage or no kids, right? My kids are all grown. I don't need any more life insurance. Hey, I don't need life insurance because, you know, I'm self-insured. My 401k will take care of everything. Man, life insurance is just so expensive. So, how does God feel about life insurance and you? Well, we'll unpack that in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad Scripture Series, starting in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping. Now I'm winning like I'm Jada. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches. Now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? Money smart guy Matt Sapal here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas, and uh, I'm very excited about this episode. But before we get started. Our goal is to get to 150,000 subs, and we're so close because once we get to 150,000 subs, we are awarding a church, charity, or nonprofit $5,000 on behalf of you and this YouTube channel called The Seven Fear Squad. So please, if you haven't done it already, please subscribe. So why am I talking about life insurance? Well, if you didn't know, September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. And more specifically, I run to people all across the faith-based community churches, all sorts of different denominations about how they feel about this subject called life insurance as it matters to their personal finances. So a couple of things, actually a few things here. Rules of engagement, you have to understand this, approaching money from a faith-based perspective is number one, money is spiritual. You gotta understand, it's just not something, even though, even though we see spreadsheets and charts and bar graphs and all those different type of things, we did an interview with Rabbi Lappin, if you check it out right here, this interview with Rabbi Lappin was a big bombshell to me because sometimes people have the same resume, they, ha they have the same amount of money, they have the same qualifications, but how does one get ahead financially and the other one goes opposite, they go broke? Well, because money is spiritual. And the second thing is victory comes with our finances through surrender. What am I talking about? In Deuteronomy 8.18, he has said that God is the one that gives us the power to create wealth. In other words, you've got the power. So what does power mean? Just because it lands on your lap doesn't mean it's direct deposited in your bank account. God has given us the power. Just like you have power in your car. Unless you have the gas to accelerate, that power doesn't translate to forward motion. So the same thing happens with the power that God has given you with your finances. If you don't hit the gas and accelerate and move forward, you will not get ahead financially. And last but not least, God wants you to continue to seek Him by seeking wisdom. And as we've defined in episodes past, Wisdom is nothing more than knowledge times experience. You combine those together. It's just not being academically smart and scholarly, or just not being street smart. It's combining street smart and academics and being scholarly and actually having experience, putting that together, and now you have wisdom. So a few things that's already established how faith-based millionaires go about building their finances, how they go about building wealth. It is established that faith-based millionaires are simply stewards. They say based on the victory through surrenders, they, I'm not owning this. Even though it's titled in my name, I, at my assets are in my name, you have to understand that it's not mine, it's God's. So when I'm looking at this, I am just simply a steward. When I'm a steward, it's not ours, it's not God's type of attitude. We got to do the most with the least because if we've been entrusted with the least and we don't do with the least, then therefore how can God trust us with the most? So constantly God is testing us, strengthening our character to be wiser stewards of the blessings that he's bestowed upon us. Number two, faith-based millionaires are big givers. They've been commanded to through tithes, offerings, and we've been commanded to give the first fruits. And number three, faith-based millionaires are also investors. They understand that diversification is a powerful thing for them to have. Let me unpack that real quick. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse two. It reads like this. Give portions to seven, yes to eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. So in other words, if you're looking at your farmland, you're looking at your investments, you're looking at your areas of opportunity, if you don't put your money in different slots, who knows what might happen to this lot, who knows what might happen to that land, who, who may knows what happened with other things. If you don't split it up, well, you're stuck. I've seen so many people because of the height of either real estate, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, they're selling everything, put it into this thing. It's like they're putting everything on black, baby. They're putting everything on a gamble. And what does the Bible say about that? He says to diversify it also. One of the lands of diversification is the subject of insurance. I'll get into that here in a second. And also, becoming a faith-based millionaire from generation to generation is not about creating general wealth quickly. Let me explain. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21 
it reads like this. An inheritance quickly gained at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. Now, oftentimes you see so many people, man, they're just hustling, hustling, grinding, grinding, grinding. Oh, I got rich, I got rich, I got rich. And that's the disposition. They don't trust the process and the evolution. Okay, I got my wealth, boom. I got my wealth, boom. I got wealth, what am I learning through this? It's God's money. What am I doing with this? Or am I necessarily putting it to risk? So keep that in mind as we establish the way faith-based millionaires go about building wealth. So before we get into my thoughts here about how I process and I'm reading the scripture from a biblical perspective of being a faith-based millionaire, I want to disclose to you, I am not a pastor. I didn't go to Bible college. I don't have a master's degree or a PhD. I'm not a Bible scholar uh, in these areas. Shoot, I don't even have a college degree, period. I happened to run a business for the last 22 years, fairly successful. That's how I made my money. But I just want to let you know, disclose you, don't put any unnecessary pressure upon me that I'm a pastor, I'm a bishop, I'm a deacon. Listen, I'm just a lay person in the church on Sundays that believes I have a business which causes me to be a king in the marketplace and my wife a queen in the marketplace, that we have an opportunity to have a business to steward over to make sure that we help God's people Monday through Saturday to incorporate God's teaching that we hear on Sunday mornings. So don't depend on me to feed you these scriptures. Now I'll share with them, I'll share with you the references, etc. but go and read yourself. I want you to be an independent thinker. Don't depend on a pastor, don't even depend on me to read the Bible for you. I would want you to research what I have to say. Some of you down the road may either argue with me that you don't agree with me. Some of you say may argue with you right now. Say, oh, you know, Matt, I, based on that research and reading, based on what religion has taught me through my upbringing in church, I realized that, well, my way about going about money is wrong and I should become wealthy. I should seek to find wealth. Of course, be connected to God. That's the first thing. And we're not using this Bible to get rich. That's not the point. But the point is, at the end of the day, you and I have to pay our bills. You and I have to fund and finance our ministries. If that means we need to make a lot of money through our businesses, through our careers, through our business, through our investments, to fund and finance the things that God has blessed upon our spirit and inspired through us through, through uh, signs and, and prophecy, well, brother and sister, let's go for it. So let's take a look at what I'm thinking when I'm reading about how faith-based millionaires use life insurance. Because God provides us provision, not protection. Let's take a look at this. Life will hit you hard. Let's go to John chapter 16, verse 33. It reads like this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. <laughs> of course, those are red words. That's Jesus talking. You know, the OG rabbi. And so when God is looking and giving us that instruction, he's saying, listen, man, life is going to hit you in the mouth. As much as I can't protect you, I can't. Life is going to hit you. But he says, if you trust in me, that I provide you the financial resources, the financial instruments, the strategies to get the provision, not the protection, to make sure you lessen the blow when life hits you, go for it and do it. Now, I'm referencing this quote here, which I think is a very, very powerful book here. Money Came By the House the other day, which is written by a, a former uh, Jewish a man converted to Christianity. He's a CPA, a certified public accountant, Robert Katz, and he shares in his book, I think it's a very powerful quote. I read this in 2000, when I read this book, I always date my books. I read this in 2003, okay? He says here, a wise steward will use every proper means available to him to protect what has been trusted to his care, and that includes insurance. And this is coming from a CPA, a certified public accountant who helps people with finances on a daily basis. Because here's the thing, if you know the worst of life can come your way, and for some of you is already coming your way, you've got to anticipate. So a large part about building wealth, generational wealth, is all about anticipation, because you know life is going to hit you in the mouth. You know, life is going to hit you hard. So what do we do to anticipate? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 12. It reads like this. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. You know what being simple is? Oh, God will provide. Oh, God is sufficient. Yes, true. Amen. Hallelujah. But you, watching this video, you have to do something about it. If God is sufficient, it means he's provided a financial instrument for you to take advantage, to take it from your bank account, to take it from one pocket, put it into another pocket, 
that will provide the financial protection necessary for you to withstand the financial storm that will come your way. And when it does come your way, guess what? Thank God the Lord provided a financial resource for me, such as insurance, to make sure I was able to weather that financial storm. So God, again, provides you provision, not protection. The second thing here is do not be a burden, but be a blessing. Don't be a burden. Stop leaning on other people. Oftentimes people say, yeah, man, I'm just going to lean on family. I'm just going to lean on the government. I'm going to lean on this social program. I'm going to lean on this government program. I'm going to lean on my company for this stuff. No, no, no. That's not the way God intends you to live your life. The only person God wants you to lean on is him. Not anybody else, not other people, not family, not relatives, not your employer, not your brother, not your sister, not your children. You lean on God. And when you lean on God, then you become a major blessing. Let's take a look at this. So name, what type of name are you building? What type of reputation are you building? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, it reads like this. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. You know, there's a time in my life where I would walk into a bank. My finances are so messed up. I'd walk into my bank and they recognize my name. They recognize my face. They connect the face to a name and vice versa. And they're like, oh, that's that guy. Yep. He's asking for his bank charges to be refunded. <laughs> Listen, guys, I didn't tell you that being a faith-based millionaire, at least for me, was a perfect path. I've had my ups and downs, so I hope you don't judge me. But if you do, oh, well, I get it. But I was that guy. My name meant this guy was asking for his bank charge because he keeps overdrafting his account because he's mismanaging his finances. Well, since getting saved and since following God's path of what he has destined for me, I started saying, you know what? I better take this responsibility of finance because it's not the bank I'm trying to please. It's not the people in my job or my family I'm trying to please. I want to please God. I want to honor God. I need to get these finances under control. Anyway, make a long story short, I took a $500 investment and created a $50 million company out of it. There's a video of how I did that right here. I took $500 and became a multimillionaire because I got straight with my finances. I got serious about my relationship with God. I got serious about this last name that I'm carrying because I believe that everyone, every person in every generation, if you, you're in that family's generation, only takes only one person. Only takes one person in a family's generation to make a decision, to do something bold, to stick their family name financial flag in the ground and change that family's last name forever. And God, Deuteronomy 8.18 has given us the power to do so. But again, it's up for you to utilize that power because a name and a reputation is unbelievable. Think about this real quick. If, imagine if I said these names, what do you think about them? If I said the names Kennedy, what do you think about it? Powerful name? What about Walton of the Walmart family? What do you think about it? Powerful name? Vanderbilt. What do you think it? Very powerful name. What about Disney? Powerful name. Gates. Powerful name. Bezos. Powerful name. Musk. Powerful name. Bet David. Powerful name. What about your last name? What happens when people say your last name? They see your picture. They see it. And do they say, wow, powerful name? Do they? Well, God wants you to have a good name. He wants you to have a good reputation. It's bigger than a credit score. It's bigger than what FICO thinks about you. It's when you walk into, now it's a completely different story these days. I walk into a bank, you know, the bank says, oh, Mr. Sapala, would you like to have coffee? Please sit down. How can we help you today? <laughs> My life is completely different today. It's not like, oh, it's that guy. Now it's, oh, Mr. Sapala. Listen, I, uh, we just recently celebrated my wife's birthday this weekend. And uh, they come to find out that the Sapala's money smart guy in the seven figure squad and our agency is moving from Chicago to Dallas. I make a couple calls, blah, 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 blah. They look us up. Oh, wow. Can't believe you're in our neighborhood. I said, you know what? You'll be really special. I know you guys are doing a march -a this weekend with a high school band in our neighborhood. You know, uh, would you mind coming by our house and, and doing a few songs for our family and wishing my wife a happy birthday? You know, my wife was born on 9-11. She was a sweet 16 at the time when she, you know, sadly the 9-11 incident happened in 2001. And since 16 years old up until now, her birthday has been, you know, a very sad day. And so I want to brighten up her day because I know this is her day. This is her birthday. And so make a long story. She'll make a couple calls. And uh, based on the uh, blessing that might come my way, a blessing based on my own giving, 
to this organization, say, hey, Matt, we would love to come by your house and welcome you to the neighborhood and bless your house and bless your name and bless your move and bless your wife with a happy birthday celebration. And uh, by the way, if you guys want to check it out, here's a quick clip. Let's check this out. And look at that. They even said our last name right. My last name, the Sapata last name, is usually the most butchered last name, but they pronounce our name properly. And bless my wife, bless our son, and this high school man, Hebron High School Marching Band. Appreciate you guys and look forward to continuing to build a deeper, deeper relationship with you. But that's what we're supposed to do. It's supposed to be a blessing to other people that when you go into a neighborhood, you walk into a boardroom, people are like, oh, they're here? Damn, let's do business. I know they're straight. I know they're solid. I know they're not going to play any games, let's get business done. And here's the thing too as well, don't try to do everything yourself. Scripture says that to seek a multitude of counselors, this is an OG proverb that we constantly bring up, I think every other video. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse five through six. It reads like this. A wise man has great power, and a man of knowledge increases strength. For waging war, you need guidance, and for victory, many advisors. Who's advising you? Oftentimes I ask people, you want to get wealthy? Yeah, I do. Great. So who's in your corner? Like who? Like who's coaching you? That's not only helping you, but more importantly, been there, done that. Are they also somebody making half a million dollars a year coaching you? No. Are they somebody making seven figures a year because that's what you want to make? No. Well, whose counsel are you seeking to help you? Well, YouTube? Well, that person on YouTube, even, by the way, even for me, I'm not enough. You need somebody locally over your shoulder helping you out to incorporate the things that you read about, you watch, that you take notes on, are you seeking a multitude of counselors? Number three, are you creating and passing on an inheritance? Should you? That's the reason why people are buying life insurance is in an instant way to create an estate. Listen, the life insurance industry, based on the premiums that they're charging, the cost of it on a monthly basis, has gotten less and less expensive. I've been through different life insurance tables in terms of cost per thousand of dollars of insurance. Three different styles, three different tables. It was a 1980, a CSO table where the cost is so, for, for example, if you are a certain age or a gender, per thousands of dollars of life insurance, they charge you this. They started, so when I started my career, they charged X in 1980. But because people are living longer, guess what they started doing? They reduced the over cost of charge because people weren't dying sooner, they were dying later. So guess what happens when people die later? The insurance company said, well, we're holding on to money longer. We're holding on to the premiums longer. People are dying later. And if we're holding to that money longer, that means we're making more money from it. So therefore we can pass on those savings to our customers, the people are buying life insurance. So why don't we go ahead and lower the overall cost of insurance? And guess what happened in 2001? So when I first started in 1999, a couple years later, three years later, they shifted the cost of insurance to be cheaper just three years later because the insurance companies had to adjust to the 2001 CSO tables, therefore making the cost of insurance per thousand dollars per age and gender cheaper and less expensive. And guess what happened in here just last year? Guess what, guess what, guess what they did? They incorporated the 2017 cost uh, CSO tables, cost of insurance tables. And they said, you know what? If people are living longer, even more so, guess what the cost of insurance had done? So therefore, since people are living longer due to modern medicine, uh, the focus today on health and wellness, I mean, look at the average 50-year-old today, the average 60-year-old today, the average 70-year-old today. People today are still working in their 70s. People still working even closer to the 80s. Back in the day, if you watch the Beverly Hill Hillbillies, Granny, who was 60 years old, who was portrayed as a six-year-old grandma in that show, for some of his black and white, if you caught the uh, color version, well, amen, God bless you. But back in the day, grandma was a 60-year-old grandma. She looked old. She looked haggard. She carried on a shotgun. But in the movie, she was portrayed as a grandma at age 60 years old. Today, 60 years old, you look good. Today, people are competing in bodybuilding at 60 years old, looking good. So what do you think is going to be happening to you long term? And is your money, your finances, your good, is it going to last you that long? Which is another conversation. And or is your money going to be passed on from one generation to another? Are you going to pass on the generational wealth? Because a good man or woman leaves his children's children an inheritance. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 13, verses 22. It reads like this. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. It's stored up for the righteous. You know, listen, 
Do you want your children to be blessed? Do you want your children to have a, a better time? Do you want them to have a head start? Don't you wish you had a financial head start when you grew up? Don't you? When did you want to have access to maybe private uh, school education, have access to better healthcare activities, camps, AAU, not having to do as many fundraisers? Instead of practicing and, and improving your craft and your game, you're out there trying to raise cash and capital to go to your traveling league? How about education? Instead of borrowing from the banks and backed by Uncle Sam, you now have your money working for you because somebody in your generation made a wise decision to bless you and accelerate your opportunities in your life faster and sooner and quicker because they established a family trust fund. Guess what family wealth banks are able to do? That's exactly what we're talking about here is you are in a position to not only leave an inheritance to your children, but your children's children. And this is what a good man or a good woman does. And right now, these insurance companies, their policies and their premiums and the cost of insurance today, they're like daring you to buy life insurance. Now, you gotta qualify for it with health, you gotta qualify for it with you know, underwriting and all that, but if you don't have life insurance, you're depending purely on what your employer gives you, my friend, and you leave that employer, you've just left behind an insurance policy that now potentially you might be not in a good position health-wise to qualify for your own personal policy because you're depending on your employer's policy. And sadly, you might not even qualify for your own personal life insurance policy. So a few questions I'd like for you to ask yourself as you're processing uh, this video. Number one, am I leveling up financially? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse seven. It reads like this. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. <laughs> Again, the rich rule over the poor it means that since biblical days, there's sadly, there's going to be a difference between rich people and poor people for the test of time. Why? Going back to biblical days, this happened. And what do you think is going to happen another 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, 2,000 years from now? You think there's going to be rich people and poor people? Of course. Of course. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is, is my family, is my last name, my children, my children's children, are they going to be richer over a period of time or are they going to be poorer? Because here's what you can leave them. An inheritance or you can leave them in debt and what did your scripture says just say the rich will rule over the poor do you want your children to be ruled over or do you want your children to be the ruler because the borrower is servant to the lender do you want your children enslaved to the lenders or do you want your children enslaved to God to say I'm financially free I can make a decision as a inheritance of this last name of the Johnson family the Williams family or the Sanchez family or the Dalio name or the Ipudapu name. <laughs> God, there's so many names out there. By the way, if you're believing that you are gonna leave your children in inheritance, put it down here in the comment section. I am leaving my children's children in inheritance. Put it right there. If you believe you're gonna leave your children in inheritance, put, I'm leaving my children's children in inheritance. Put it in the comment section if you affirm that you're gonna be doing that. But are you wanting your children if you're not looking at life insurance, if you're not looking for a way to leverage this financial tool that's been provided by the good Lord to create this financial instrument to put your money into that can be a very tax advantage vehicle to generate uh, wealth transfers from one generation to another. I mean, think about the, how, how the power of life insurance, let's, for example, we've had many ins insurance cases. I've been doing this now for 22 years. We had a very simple case where a grandmother put 50,000, she goes, I don't need a CD anymore. I don't need to see it. I don't need to live on it. Social Security is good. My pension is good. My 401k is awesome. I never need this $50,000. She was 65, 70 years old. She put $50,000, late 60s, put $50,000 to an insurance policy. Sadly, she passed away many years later. But at $50,000, grew to $200,000 instantly from day one because of leveraging a life insurance contract. Because from day one, that $50,000 qualifying for underwriting, making sure she was fairly healthy that the prescription drug, drugs that she was taking was okay with the insurance companies, that their cash deposit was solid, it, was, it goes right into the policy as soon as she gets approved for it, from day one, turns to $200,000. Income tax-free to the next generation according to IRS code 101A. Okay, and when that happens, guess what? It doesn't matter if it's a, a day later she passes away or 10 years later that she passes away, instantly that $50,000 turns into $200,000. So the question for a lot of people is what does $50,000 have to do to, in order to grow to $200,000 after tax instantly from day one? What type of interest or rate of return am I looking for in an investment to give me that type of $200,000 from day one? It's not out there, but that's what life insurance can do. So what, do you, what am I doing to level up my family financially? Uh, when I was in the military, the first life insurance policy I bought was like 15 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. It's called SGI Services Ruth Life Insurance. 
you know, when I entered the insurance industry, I knew I was transitioning out of the military, so I purchased my own private life insurance policy. I started with a, a 100, 150 buck uh, a dollar policy. Today, we put tens of thousands of dollars a month into our life insurance policy. So I started inexpensively and very cheaply. So therefore, I had something because I was a single father of three kids. So if something happened to me, my children and my, 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 my three children would be blessed financially and, and leveled up to have access to, to their dreams and their goals, even though the father's not living anymore. If my dreams die, it doesn't mean my children's dreams die either because I have life insurance set aside for them. I want to make sure that my beneficiary at that time was my parents before I got married here it was my parents and they had the money to send my children to whatever school they wanted to because I had plenty of money in an insurance policy as a financial resources of provisions to send them to the next level of their dreams and goals number two am I exposed let's look at first Timothy 5 through 8 now this is a very heavy one there let's look at first Timothy 5 through 8 am I exposed what am I really doing by not leaving my children inheritance? Let's take a look at 1 Timothy 5 through 8. It reads like this. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Ouch. Ouch. So in other words, if you're not taking this command by God, saying, listen, man, if you're not providing for your family, it's better that you don't believe me. Because even if you don't trust me, you don't believe me, it's better you don't believe me, don't, don't put your money into life insurance. Hey, by the way, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, don't, don't try to take out the messenger here. Go research it for yourself. First Timothy 5, 3, he's saying, listen, if you're not providing an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, a, a financial inheritance to your family, it better that you don't believe in me. It's better that you don't believe in God. It's better that you believe in his son, Jesus. <laughs> it's pretty tough words there. Ask yourself this last question here. Who can and will help me? Who can and will help me? And for how long? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. It reads like this. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. Don't, don't you want your family to have financial peace? Don't you want your family to have a financial inheritance, to have a head start in the next generation? Didn't you wish you had a head start? My final thoughts here. This is a very powerful uh, proverb from King Solomon. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 11 through 12. It reads like this. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. See, my friends, you don't know when the good Lord is going to take you home. So for those of you thinking, oh yeah, I'll do it later. Yeah, I'll do it next week. Yeah, I'll do it next month. Yeah, I'll do it later on in a year. You never know. Nobody ever predicted that this whole COVID-19 pandemic would ever come across our country. Nobody ever planned for it. The last time something like this happened was 1917 Spanish flu, over 100 years ago. Sadly, we've had many people pass away in the last 30 days. My good friend from the Marine Corps, God bless your soul, Maurice Williams. He and I were in the Marine Corps together. Sadly, he uh, lost his life to cancer two days ago. I wasn't predicting that a year ago. He and I were just rapping. We're just hanging out. We're doing our business deals together. In, he's, he lives in Delaware. And next thing you know, he tells me this is sad news. It wasn't COVID that killed him, even though he got it during the pandemic. Sadly, he lost his life to cancer. And sadly, I think many of you also are dealing with those type of situations. You never know when your time, your hour will come with the good Lord calls your home. If that's the case, then I implore you, if you haven't done so already, take a look at how insurance can be something that you install into your stewardship in a handling of your finance to make sure you leave an inheritance to your children and your children's children. So before I let you go, I know I unpacked here, I basically unpacked the strategy and the attitude and the spiritual uh, references of that. But if you want more specific details, check out this video right here. It's one of my most watched videos here on how millionaires use life insurance to build wealth. And this other video here also is about making money, the biblical perspective, three biblical truths about money. Folks, we had a lot in this episode, so please drop me your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, your, your questions, put them in the comment section below. You agree with me? You don't agree with me? Please, I'd like to know here in the comment section below. With that being said, guys, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. That being said, I'm your Money Smart Guy from Dallas, Texas. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to live smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys.